Mário Cabral, sou professor do Mackenzie. Inicialmente, gostaria de agradecer o professor Otaviani pelo convite, cumprimentar o professor Alessandro pela organização de um evento tão, tão relevante. O professor Alessandro, além da sua relevante produção acadêmica, tem se notabilizado pela organização de eventos em memória de grandes brasileiros, né? em homenagem a grandes brasileiros. Já tive a oportunidade de ver aqui, no São, né, São Francisco, eventos em homenagem a Celso Furtado, Darcy Ribeiro, é, Fábio Conde Comparato. Recentemente, tive a alegria de presenciar um evento em homenagem a um, um grande brasileiro, talvez menos lembrado do que deveria, que foi Santiago Dantas. Né? E hoje temos a honra de ter um evento em homenagem ao professor Mangabeira Unger, esse intelectual que, além de uma conhecida por todos produção acadêmica, ousa pensar para além da reiteração da norma posta, da reafirmação de teorias dominantes estabelecidas. Então, é uma grande satisfação. A satisfação maior ainda é ter conosco nessa tarde, o professor Samuel Wellman, de Yale, e também o professor José Crisóstomo de Souza, da Grande Universidade Federal da Bahia. Então, inicialmente, eu passo a palavra para o professor Samuel Wellman. It's a great pleasure, professor Wellman, it's a great honor, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Good to see everyone. It's a wonderful privilege to be invited to speak at this honorary occasion. Uh, I do so as a former student of uh, Roberto's. I suppose to be culturally appropriate, I'll need to call him Professor Mangabera here. Uh, and later, I was privileged to be uh, a colleague and a co-teacher uh, of his in a couple of classes. Uh, I was asked to speak about his philosophy And so I'll begin that way and then turn to the way in which uh, he's been out of time uh, and has had a failed reception, I believe, in the intellectual politics of our era, but that uh, he might have an opening now uh, uh, for various reasons. So to make it uh, even more interesting for myself, I'm going to focus the first philosophical Uh, half of what I want to say about Professor Mangabera on a gift he once gave me when I left Harvard as a student, which was a mimeograph of a course that he gave on social theory in Harvard College in spring of 1976, which I treasured for a while until I later realized that he had put it on his website. So now everyone can download it, and it's no longer a secret uh, treasure of mine. Uh, 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 and uh, in that work, I think uh, we can locate a pivotal moment in uh, Professor Mangabera's intellectual evolution because I believe it was then, in, in 1976, that certain things crystallized that have uh, remained more or less stable through his intellectual trajectory since. So it's a good place to look for what have been his fundamental philosophical commitments. Uh, and interesting to look back slightly, but then forward, even through our own time and some of his latest works from the vantage points of that uh, lecture class. As we know, as we've heard from Professor uh, Savio earlier and several others, uh, Pr Professor Mangavera wanted to be uh, a renovator of the tradition of social theory, but of course it was in a unique vein and I want to get as precise as I can about the innovation that he has intended to bring to the tradition of social theory stretching back to the early modern period and then in modern times through Karl Marx and Emil Durkheim and Max Weber and so forth. Because along with uh, his insistent uh, a need to uh, rehabilitate their structural account of society, and some theory of the change and revision of structures in time. Uh, he also offered, I think, a quite unique basis in a transcendent human nature, which we've also heard about, 
uh, that in a way suffers the imposition of social structure and even possibly nature itself, uh, but can overcome or rise above uh, these constraints. Now, as he introduced social theory to undergraduates back in 1976, uh, he was clear and I think correct that the tradition of social theory starting from Vico who was mentioned or Montesquieu more plausibly, uh, that tradition arose through a rejection of ancient uh, metaphysics and especially the belief in an unchanging human nature. Uh, instead, it proposed, it insisted that what people are like down to their very core depends on the kinds of social relations that obtain amongst them in a particular time and place. Uh, it's, it's quite crucial then that uh, the, the modern tradition of social theory taught a doctrine of, of, of temporal invariance. There are things that don't change even as more superficial things uh, do and those things were the forms themselves in Plato's doctrine but uh, more broadly in ancient metaphysics human nature uh, and in politics it followed that we should locate what doesn't change and then adjust what we can control in light of it uh, so a classic example is at the end of Plato's Republic uh, where uh, uh, Glaucon is told that the point of the exercise is to look up into the heavens and to see what doesn't change and then build the city, if he can, uh, in light of it. And so there's artifice, but it's in light of this unchanging reality that humans can't change, uh, that exists in the same way everywhere and always. Uh, and so uh, Professor Mangabera started out uh, by insisting that our task is to reject that ancient doctrine. And it was Montesquieu and his successors who uh, had discovered, uh, as he would also insist in his works of the 1980s, that society is an artifact. It had always been one. At some point, it was discovered uh, with more consciousness that humans make their social order. Uh, but, of course, in the tradition of social theory, starting with Montesquieu, uh, it wasn't the case that society was just free self-creation uh, or a constant uh, 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 will because the social order, the social relations that obtain uh, become a kind of second nature which uh, act as structural constraints. And modern social theory and discovering that artifice goes all the way down, that there's no, no nature in light of which to build society, also discovered new kinds of constraints that we impose upon ourselves, that humans, through the social structures they build, uh, uh, can make tenacious and powerful. Now, uh, this was all pretty textbook, uh, even in 1976. And it was clear that in noting the modernization that the invention of social theory involved, Professor Mangabera wanted to make his own mark. And actually, uh, not only did he insist on this fact in those lecture courses, but the same year his Law and Modern Society, uh, his second book came out, uh, which begins with a picture of the burden that the past of theory can impose on us and an insistence that we, you and I, always turn on our teachers, uh, even when they've been inspiring. Never make, he insisted, small modifications to anything you inherit, uh, but uh, uh, consider overthrowing it. Uh, he uh, used uh, a, an image that I believe came for, from very different purposes from an uncle uh, of the crab who attacks Hercules and ascends to the heavens in the constellations, 
for doing so, a kind of minor role uh, that no one should want, including those who celebrate Professor Mangabera's uh, own achievements, and I'll come to that at the end. So how did Professor Mangabera ch decide he would uh, hew to social theory while also reinventing it and ascend to the constellations uh, in more than a, 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 the role of a minor character? Well, I think fundamentally uh, he replaced one ancient view of human nature with another ancient view uh, and uh, rejected always the idea that along with our society, we ourselves are entirely constructed by our social relations. Instead, he insisted that the ground for his renovation of social theory was going to be a notion drawn from Judeo-Christianity, although he reinterpreted it. And I think that's his most essential commitment as far as I see it, his view of humanity as embodied spirit. Um, he didn't use this phrase, but I would say the central element in Professor Mangabera's thought is, is what I would call an incarnational metaphysics, the idea that what makes humans humans uh, is not some set of natural constraints on them that come from the outside, but their transcendence uh, and uh, however fleshly they may be, uh, the fact that they are always spirit too. In these 1976 lectures, he uh, was ecumenical about it. Uh, he began by citing a, a Hebrew prophet, Joel, who said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. That's Joel 2.28. Uh, but of course, um, I think it's only fair to say that whatever these, these earlier roots, uh, that uh, the figure of Jesus uh, as the ultimate example of embodied spirit in at Western history uh, stood at the root of what uh, Professor Mangabera uh, hoped to do uh, with the tradition of social theory. And so right after he cited Joel in those lecture classes, he went on to John 1.13, the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So what this meant, I think, is that uh, he was not really a thinker of human finitude uh, in the way you might uh, uh, associate with some other modern thinkers. Uh, instead, even though there are some beautiful passages in his work that concern human mortality and the constraints that death places upon us, uh, while we're alive, what's most important uh, in thinking about structural constraint, too, is our infinity, uh, which he uses in a non-theological sense but it's not far from theology, uh, Christian theology specifically. You could say that in his most careful formulations, it was offered as a kind of relative infinity, as he always would put it. We are infinite relative to what surrounds us, which includes our own character or personality for individuals, but social institutions for humans collectively. Uh, now, it was from this point of departure that I think most of, of Roberto's, Professor Mangabera's uh, later works flow. Two very simple ideas that were rich with implications. It's very interesting. I had failed to notice this before, but in these same uh, spring 1976 lectures, uh, already he announces that he has been led to overthrow a book he published only one year before, his first book, Knowledge and Politics, and, and acknowledges uh, that it had been misconceived because it didn't get the relationship between ancient and modern right. Uh, 
he wrote that he had proposed to conduct a polemic against the modern metaphysics in the language of the ancient one, although he wrote, I did not and do not want to reinstate the Aristotelian view of the world. But uh, it would be false, again, to uh, conclude that uh, from that criticism that he didn't have uh, an alternative relationship to ancient doctrine, in particular Christian doctrine. Uh, and it's this incarnational metaphysics that I think uh, provided a different path from the past to his own present and the future. What's I think interesting for us in, in the way he defended this relationship is his insistence that we always return to the past in order to save the, the kernel of living truth from it, whatever it is. And to his undergraduates in 1976, he, he said this very explicitly. In the end, we must always return to the traditions we have cast off and rescue the truth they contain from the error in which it is buried. A plausible question would be, does the same apply to him? But again, we'll have to get to that. I have to say, just digressing for a moment, that um, I don't know how his work it has been translated or if he has into Portuguese, but one of the experiences of a reader of his English prose, and especially perhaps these early writings that I'm discussing now, uh, is his remarkable prose mm -hmm. style, which combine a few features that uh, are rare and even more rarely come together because his writings are always lucid and simple but also can verge on poetry. And just in that spirit, I want to read uh, another somewhat lengthier passage from the lectures which make this same point about the kind of salvage operation in relation to uh, the salvation religions that got him started on his reform of social theory. Here it goes. I tweeted this the other day uh, in hopes that people could guess who had written it. Actually, one did. The child, he says, must rebel against its parents. The students must turn against his, their teachers. And the artist must shatter the conventions that made his art possible. All lasting achievement begins in imitation, progresses through betrayal, and ends with the reestablishment of continuity at a deeper level. For this is the law of the spirit, that it is only by renouncing what one loves that one can recreate it. Okay, so I, as, 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 as basic as this is, I think we can't afford to skip this moment in Professor Mangavera's intellectual evolution because I think it was formative for what he's done since. A transcendence of embodied spirit over social settings would be the master theme of what he wrote, including about very concrete problems ever after. Now later in his career, uh, in his cosmology book, uh, he also insisted that the laws of society uh, uh, are not enough to challenge, but that the laws of nature themselves should never be considered outside time and change, uh, which required a very separate argument from any claims on the basis of our human uh, incarnational metaphysics. But nonetheless, it's, it's quite interesting that in the end, the radicalism of Professor Mangavera's embrace of the notion that time goes all the way down and change is the only continuity um, extended to non-human nature itself. But I don't want to follow that last bit of radicalism because I, I'd rather spend uh, the next few minutes exploring how these commitments, these philosophical ideas, which he spelled out uh, in more concrete ways in later writings have been out of fashion or out of time uh, and how we can think about them, especially at least if my country is an example in light of the coming 
uh, waves of Marxism, against which Professor Mangabetta battled, even as Marxism itself in the North Atlantic was dying its last uh, deaths, theoretically, but now seems set to return uh, as a powerful default option for radical intellectuals. And so it could be that in exploring these alternatives, theoretically, that he offered, we will have something to use as uh, Marxism makes a, a fairly spectacular return in social theory, at least progressive social theory. So I, I, I will speak again from the perspective of Anglo-American or North Atlantic thought, but it would only be fair to say from that perspective that Professor Mangabera lived has lived to date in a time that was incredibly inhospitable to the views philosophically and in social theory that he started to propound in the middle of the 1970s, now more than 40 years ago. Uh, because it's not just that in politics, conservatives and neoliberals tended to win as that theoretically, including in progressive theory, uh, the sorts of uh, ideas that he has offered us uh, were broadly ignored uh, and uh, suffered, I think, a fairly serious indignity because uh, they, they never became fashionable uh, for various reasons. Um, I think that uh, 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 it's, it's not just, as some of the later speakers may insist, that some baleful orthodoxies swept the social sciences and, and, uh, and made economics, in particular, uh, the kind of master social science in a particularly uh, baleful version. But that on the left itself, uh, even within a dying Marxism, uh, the Marxist theory that was celebrated in the 1980s and 90s was a culturalist Marxism that circled around uh, what was called Western Marxism, uh, which said very little about the means of production and the social structural constraints that followed from it, but said a lot about uh, the mourning that's required of us under so-called late capitalism. And the irony in this is that Marxism's own discourse of structural constraint was marginal, uh, even amongst those who preserved its memory. Uh, and uh, in a kind of compensatory move, I think, uh, as I interpret it, largely as a result of the experience of political defeat on the left in 1960s and, and 1970s, even Marxism became a broadly escapist kind of discourse uh, in which uh, figures from Western Marxism in general and the Frankfurt School in particular uh, provided a kind of escapist uh, option to the extent that those traditions were made more relevant, it was in the direction of liberal democracy with very little structural imagination, as in the great era of the Frankfurt School mentioned earlier, Jürgen Habermas. But I think what's, what's important is that Roberto never wanted his intellectual enterprise to participate in this escapist syndrome, this compensatory syndrome, even though it was sweeping at least the Northern Academy. In, in those 1976 lectures, I think this is the last time I'll mention them, he considered this popular uh, understanding of theory and denounced it as what he called, in his words, a magic wand with which to change one's situation without the need to struggle, to suffer, and to wait. Now we can debate whether uh, Roberto's theory, notably his mid-1980s uh, summa, uh, ever got as concrete 
as a practical actors in politics needed and still need. Uh, and I'm not sure about that. But it was clearly a heroic attempt to make good on the reform of social theory through this incarnational metaphysics. Uh, the irony is that when those achievements uh, were published in the mid-1980s, although I wasn't present, I read all of this in the aftermath as a, a younger person, Roberto's approach was broadly dismissed in the North as utopian. I think looking back, we can say that the shoe was on the, the other foot or the reverse was the case uh, because he was thinking at the time when a couple of generations depressed by the shipwreck of political radicalism and seeking something compensatory uh, really spurned the opportunity to um, think about his uh, his approach and how it might apply to their own situation, and so it didn't gain much traction. Now, as I say, that could mean that the time for his thinking to gain traction in various places, including Brazil, is now. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess that's going to be up to the younger people to determine. Now, let me turn towards the end by addressing this revival of Marxism. Uh, which has always been the default theory on the left, uh, in spite of various attempts to supplement it, including Professor Mangabeira's own. Uh, it's popular, again, at least in the global north, not least because a new generation wants to defiantly reject the escapism of its elders, and that's a good thing. Uh, and yet, the return seems to be uh, at, with a kind of muscle memory to the crudest forms of Marxism. And it's precisely here that I think uh, returning to the social theory that uh, Roberto built could be of most use to us. So in that spirit, I want to talk for my last bit about a, a piece that I think it, uh, it may have been the most uh, widely noticed attack on Professor Mangabera in the English language at least in the past 20 years. Now it would be characteristic of Roberto that he hasn't read it uh, or may not even know of it uh, but everyone else does who is grappling with his work and so I believe it requires some engagement. Now I'm referring to an essay written by a Marxist who's Australian teaching in England at the London School of Economics named Susan Marx, uh, who comes by her name honestly. Uh, her article is entitled False Contingency. And it is a respectful uh, critique of Professor Mangabera, principally making the argument that in his works of the 1980s, and notably in his longest book, False Necessity, Roberto's rhetoric went too far and convinced uh, those in critical legal studies in particular to endorse a kind of worship of voluntarism and fetish of the contingent in the evolution of social relations that she then, from a Marxist perspective, denounced as mistaken. There's a great deal of talk, she says, about how things that are contingent are made to seem as if they were necessary in virtue of being natural, universal, rational, eternal, and so forth, but much less discussion of voluntarist mystifications. Now, I think she was right that uh, Roberto's old critique of the naturalization of social relationships became old hat. It doesn't get us very far by itself. Uh, and it may be true that many of Roberto's readers overdid it. And for sure, it's plausible to identify uh, Professor Mangabera's social theory uh, uh, as the search for possibility amidst structural forces without a, enough detailed 
exposition of how structural determination still bears on agents and societies. For sure, it, it was fair of those uh, works to vilify the way in which most inherited social theories were necessitarian. Uh, and yet, it wasn't as if all Roberto wanted to do was refute the baleful doctrine of structural uh, necessity. Uh, so as she goes on, Susan Marks charges that uh, Professor Mangabera just went too far in the opposite direction, as if we could just replace the mistake of false necessity with true contingency. Uh, and she writes, we need to be on guard against false contingency. That's her coinage. Things don't have to be as they are, but history is not just a matter, she writes, of chance and will. The concept of false contingency uh, refers to all the limits and pressures, tendencies and orientations over determination and determination in the last instance that shape realities and possibilities. Now, it bears noting uh, that her proposal was actually to avoid both extremes, to reject false necessity and false contingency in a kind of synthesis. But the point I want to make is that Roberto, Professor Mangabera, had already done that. That was his proposal, uh, to reinvent social theory, to adopt its longstanding inquiry into structural constraint and determination without giving them the last word in the name of this incarnationist metaphysics. Indeed, in the way I've just um, repeated her charges, there's something awry because she seems to give the impression in this class, now classic article, much cited article, that if you're interested in contingency, you're interested in the aleatory or random, a chance, uh, but that's not true. Uh, that's to pretend that beyond necessity, all there is would be the swerve of the atoms, in, like in ancient Epicurean physics. But I don't think that's the best account of the contingent, and it's not the one that I have found in Professor Mangabera's writing. Rather, the claim was that uh, structures, structural realities never admit of one outcome. Uh, and we can never know in advance how fully they dominate until their mutability has been tested uh, through attempted renovation of structures. Uh, first analytically or second analytically since Professor Mangabera often insisted that uh, striking out as an activist in some direction may come before theoretical insight into what one's doing. Now I've heard uh, this essay by Susan Marks, False Contingency, routinely cited in the many conferences I've gone to in the Global North where Professor Mangabera's name comes up, and especially by Marxists, because they insist that what we need now after the financial crisis especially, and the victory of neoliberalism is some account of determination rather than agency. But again, that doesn't conflict, at least in the abstract, with what a Professor Mangabera was calling for. Although to be fair, I don't know in his writings of a developed account of the structural history of neoliberalism and its victory in our time and therefore what alternatives uh, it leaves us with in spite of as an, and an account of, on account of its constraints. Okay, so I think a contest is brewing. Uh, Marxism is coming back in a vulgar or more sophisticated form and it will very much matter uh, uh, how one responds to it or makes it more sophisticated. And for all these reasons, 
uh, Professor Mangabera's attempt on the basis of this incarnational metaphysics, however dubious it was, uh, to make an argument for the reconciliation of freedom and structure and contingency and necessity will be of great interest. Okay, I think I have one or two minutes left, so I just will close in a very different direction. Uh, as I anticipated at the beginning, uh, Professor Mangabera wouldn't want us to honor him except by smashing any idol that we may be tempted to set up in his honor. Uh, he insisted back in the lectures with which I began that it's the wrong devotion to pay to our masters to follow them at a minimum without living through the experience of rejecting them. And I hope that uh, we have all been illustrating at this conference uh, the importance not just of honoring, but also of betraying him. But uh, it would be wrong not to conclude with another notion uh, that I have gotten much less from his works than from conversation and teaching. In those settings, one of, of Professor Mangabera's trademarks is to cite old aphorisms uh, of uh, long dead classical thinkers uh, whom few read any longer. Uh, he just did a couple of times at lunch uh, since he's always in character. And I remember uh, one uh, that he cited routinely in his classes uh, with which I'd like to close uh, my presentation because it bears in a very different way than idol smashing on how we should relate to our forebears and uh, those who have uh, done something amazing uh, 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 in, before, before us. It's a line that comes from uh, the greatest German poet uh, and it goes like this. Uh, in the face of the extraordinary, maybe superior, I don't remember the exact citation. In the face of the extraordinary achievements of another, the only self-defense we have is love. Thank you. Thank you.